I'll jump into it then. So I'm Carl. I work on the user experience design team on the research sub team. And I'm going to be talking about benchmarking usability in OpenShift. This is a project that we did um, a couple years ago. And um, I'll go over kind of how benchmarking usability works in general first and then give a walk through what we actually ended up doing. Um, so yeah, let's well, first talk about what benchmarking is. This might be a familiar concept. We'll get a nicely specific uh, definition of usability so we can figure out how to actually benchmark that. Um, why we might actually want to do this in the first place because it can be a, a big undertaking. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we'll go over how we actually implemented this on the user experience design team. So first of all, what is a benchmark? You can just look this up on Wikipedia. It's any metric or measurement that is consistent that you can apply over and over again. So this could be uh, CPU performance in an application, uh, manufacturing accuracy, or um, how much it takes to, or how much it costs to make any kind of um, unit that you're making. And then benchmarking is just how we get that measurement. So this could be imposing a workload on a system to see how that CPU fares, uh, the number of defects that come out of a manufacturing process, or a unit cost analysis. So what is usability? Um, we need to, this is obviously a little less tangible, so we need to um, zoom in on this to understand how we can actually go about measuring it. So broadly speaking, usability is just anybody's quality of experience when interacting with a product or a system. Um, in order to measure this, though, we look for um, a little more um, defined way of talking about it. So we go to the International Organization for Standardization's definition, um, the ISO 9241-11. So this gets referenced a lot in the user experience world if people want to be real technical with how they're talking about usability. But it essentially just has three main pillars that hold it up. The first is effectiveness, and this is how a user is able to complete their goal in the software or the system. And efficiency, um, which is how fast they can complete that goal. And then finally, and a little more subjectively, is satisfaction. Do they feel good about that process that they just hopefully completed in a good amount of time? So that's how we're defining usability for this benchmarking process. So now that we know what benchmarking is, we know what usability is, how can we actually benchmark it? So we'll go over again why we would want to do this in the first place, um, a few variations and features that you can make if you choose to go do a process similar to this, and how we put it all into action. So. Simply put, we just want to be sure that we're improving. With design work, it's not always as obvious as with uh, a computing system or even uh, a physical product to be sure that we're moving in the right direction. So this benchmarking process lets us be sure that the, the design changes that we're making are um, changing the ne moving the needle in the right direction. So we can get some sort of quantitative and empirical evidence that um, we're doing what we want to be doing. We can see what is changing and how much it is changing. So this is pretty much as simple as um, measuring wherever you're at, making some kind of change to uh, the product or system, and then measuring that again, comparing those measurements. And um, this is the core of benchmarking usability. There are some other side pieces to it as well, um, like you can get qualitative information that isn't a numerical metric, but can dig into the why something changed. So maybe users complete, you know, they add a project to OpenShift twice as fast, but qualitative information lets us know why that's actually changing, what's driving those quantitative metrics. And while what we did was measure a version um, compared to uh, an earlier version, you can also compare to a competitor product. If they you know, have a very similar space and a set of user goals, you can um, compare them to each other. Or you can also just compare to sort of an industry standard if you only have one version available for testing. So there are a few types of usability benchmarking. There's behavioral and there's retrospective, and these are two big buckets that we can categorize them into. So behavioral, we're actually watching participants attempt a goal in the software while they're being recorded, and we observe um, their behaviors or um, anything that happens while they're working with the software. So again, this is focused on behavior, and we're measuring the user actions as they move through um, the, the actual software. And this is different from retrospective, where we have participants recall their recent experience with the product. Um, this is more focused on their memory of the product, their attitude, their feeling towards that software. So this is often done just through questionnaires, um, or just verbally asking the person. 
So these can also be combined. You don't just have to choose one or the other. And I would argue that they uh, should be combined because people's feelings and their behaviors are often kind of split apart. I've seen people um, just miserably fail a task that was very hard to do and they shouldn't have been able to complete it. They rate it five out of five on usability. You know, whether they want to please the researcher that's kind of helping them out with this or they just, you know, don't want to look like they haven't failed. Um, it's important if you're going to capture that retrospective information to see what they're actually doing because they're not often the same thing. And levels of usability benchmarking is how zoomed in you are on this measurement. So we have task level and product level, which are kind of self-explanatory. So for the task level, we're getting a benchmark for each task. So say for OpenShift, this is add a project, um, change a configuration file, add a new user group, whatever that individual task might be. So again, we have to figure out what the users actually do here. We need to figure out what those top tasks are. And when I say top task, you can do a million things in the OpenShift interface. So you've got to figure out which ones you want to test, because you can't obviously test every single thing that you could possibly do. And this is generally done with behavior. Um, you could just ask people, again, with that questionnaire about how they felt about each task. But if you're going to have them do the task anyway, you might as well take those behavioral metrics. And for the product level, this is where we're just looking at the product overall. So say we're just asking them how they feel about OpenShift in general, not a specific task within it. And this is most often done with a retrospective um, questionnaire, email survey. Um, you might have seen something like the net promoter score, which is different than benchmarking. But where essentially, you can email people, just ask, how, how easy was this product to use? And that'll give you a real high level benchmark. But it is still a benchmark that you can use. And again, these can be combined, especially if you have people going through the tasks. You can ask them how they feel about the product overall. That gives you a little more information to triangulate. And then getting to the actual metrics. These are most often split into behavioral and retrospective. So kind of the gold standard metric for behavioral metrics in um, usability is completion rate. If the user can't complete their goal, nothing else really matters. It doesn't matter how long it takes them if they're not completing it. If they're, not, if they're satisfied and they haven't completed it, something's clearly not connecting there. So this is a really common one to measure. It's rough, but it's, it's a very good metric to capture. A little more fine-grained is error rates. You have to be able to know what every step is, if it's an error or not an error. So this can take a bit more work, but it gives a little more insight into maybe where the process is breaking down when they try to complete their goal. And then time on task is how, how quickly they um, hopefully complete their task. For retrospective, again, these are pretty much um, questionnaires. A lot of them are product level, like the system usability scale, or the SUS, as it's often referred to. It's 10 items, and it gets at essentially how learnable your system is and how usable it is. So you have people fill this out after they've completed a bunch of tasks, and you want to know how they feel about the product in general. Or again, you could just email it out. Now we have a newer scale called the UMUX Lite, um, which is just two items and captures essentially the same stuff as the system usability scale. So if you only have time for two questions or you don't expect that people are going to want to sit through 10 questions, we have some shorter options now. And then the shortest of all is single ease of use question. How easy was this to complete or how easy is this product to use? Um, so you can use that on tasks or for a product entirely. And the key here is just choose something that already exists because it's tempting to write your own scale, but um, wording is very hard on these scales, even though it might seem intuitive to write. And um, if you use something that already exists, you can be sure that people have validated it. And if you use something that already exists, you can compare to sort of an industry standard. So you, you know, if you get a four out of five on the scale you've just made, you don't really know what that means. If you use the system usability scale, you can know exactly how that stacks up to other industries and other um, products that, that are out there and have measured with that. And then the final piece before we get into uh, more specifics is moderated and unmoderated. Um, so for moderated, researchers are actively involved in the process. They're guiding users through. Um, they're fielding questions, prompting some more qualitative why information about what they're thinking. Um, and then you probably have a note taker as well. This can be done in a lot of places. When I say lab setting, it could be a big mirror uh, and that people are looking through on the other side. It could just be a conference room. Um, it could be ethnographic in the participant's work location, although that's a little bit harder to swing, but can be really interesting if you can do that. And with OpenShift, we did it all remotely. With software products especially, that's easy enough to do. 
So this is a lot more expensive, a lot more people involved. It takes a lot more time, but you get a ton more data. So that's sort of the trade-off there. Uh, you get all that qualitative information, but it, it does cost a lot more as opposed to unmoderated where participants are just completing it on their own time and there's no researcher involved in that moment. So this location could be anywhere. If that matters for your product, you don't have control over that. So if that does matter, then maybe unmoderated testing isn't a great option. And um, this is far less expensive than the moderated testing, but does come with more concerns like you don't know where people are necessarily doing um, the testing. People also tend to take longer, like if someone's adding a project in OpenShift and they get, you know, really thirsty, get a glass of water, come back, that's going to be in the data. Obviously not part of adding a project in OpenShift, but um, that will still be in there. So there's more noise to work around. You also have to be sure that your directions are extremely clear because you can't really guide them back if they get off track like you would be able to if you were there leading them through the whole process. So those are some high-level features that you can choose if you're going through a benchmarking process. Um, and then you have to put it all together. You have to get a plan. And I'll go through how that would actually come together and what we did along the way. So you'll see, and mostly in the red text, um, kind of what we did um, at each point. So for a little bit of background, um, our team wanted to get this empirical measurement of our design impact on OpenShift. So how much of a change had we created in the product? And hopefully that change was good. That's what we set out to prove. But if it wasn't that, we would have figured that out too, which would have also been useful information. So we started with version 3.5, which was before um, a major UXD effort that had taken place. And then later on, we followed up with version 3.11 after we had done some major um, user experience implementation in the design so we could compare this usability between the versions. So essentially the research question or hypothesis is that if we can demonstrate this higher usability on 3.11, this would be good evidence for um, a positive impact of our efforts on the product's usability. So you're going to see that at the top, and they'll turn in red as we kind of go through each phase in the process. So participants. Most people don't really think about this aspect. After doing it once, it's about all I think about now. This is the hardest part in the process. Start this as early as you can. It takes the longest. You have to figure out first who the right users are. And I'll give you one hint. It's not you. You're not the user. Um, you might see it on my computer sticker there. Um, it, even though it's tempting to pick yourself or someone on your team because they're right there, anyone that develop, develops the product is a lot, they're, they're too close to the product to kind of sit in the seat of the user. They know too well how it works, and they understand exactly how it's archite architected together. So you want to find an actual set of end users. It could be someone in your company if they don't develop the product at all, but even then, their understanding is probably going to be a little different than an actual end user. So for us, um, OpenShift has two broad personas, developers and admins, sysadmins. You can uh, dig in a little more there, but we essentially wanted a spread of external developers and admins to run through um, all of the tasks that we put together for this, this testing. And then this is the part that really takes a long time, is finding those users. If it's something like uh, consumer focused, um, you know, you can kind of pick people off the street. It's not that hard. If you have a more um, expert set of users like OpenShift, it can take a while, and you have to get creative with how you actually find those people. So it can be through a, one of the many websites that exist now, like userinterviews.com, where they sort of set up a panel and they scan through LinkedIn to find people. But if you think people are going to respond to a Twitter hashtag, there's nothing wrong with that. If it gets the people to you, then that's totally fine. And sometimes you do have to get creative in how you recruit for this kind of project. So um, we chose just about every avenue that we could.
one, two, one, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, check. One, two, two, one, two, three, check. One, two. One, two, three, check. Mic check. One, two, three.
set up, so we have a, a way for you to tip onto it. Um, yeah. There's HDMI and, and uh, VJ inputs, so if you want to plug in your laptop, that's fine too. Close this off if you want to use yours. I don't need audio either. Uh, this audio will go to the recording, so if oh, there's okay. anything anything on there, I'll just go in. Gotcha. I'm just going to try that one thing. Test. Can you hear me? Do I need to get it higher up? I can bring it higher up if I need to. Yep, I got it. Okay, it's on now. Uh, group six, channel four. Oh, here, I'll try and adjust this. Um, here? Is that good? Okay. Yeah, this is, this is the volume that it's at. How does it sound? Is this okay? Okay, sounds good.
I used to work in the tower until about three weeks ago I moved back to Minneapolis, where I'm originally from, so I'm back in the Midwest. Yep, the UX team, I think it's pretty split between uh, Westford and the tower, so. Yeah, I look at the Okay, so you might know a few UX D yeah. folks. Okay, yeah. cool. What do you work on? Um, so I manage a few quality insurance teams. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah, I know we have a, a rack in for a new research hire that's going to work just with QE. Um, try and kind of essentially get a little bit about what I'm talking about built into some QE processes. So, yeah, I've worked with QE a little bit, mostly when OpenShift IO was still being developed on, on that. But, yeah. Oh, no. Manage updates. Take it away. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Awesome. Well, I'll jump into it then. So I'm Carl. I work on the user experience design team on the research sub team. And I'm going to be talking about benchmarking usability in OpenShift. This is a project that we did um, a couple years ago. And um, I'll go over kind of how benchmarking usability works in general first and then give a walk through what we actually ended up doing. Um, so yeah, let's well, first talk about what benchmarking is. This might be a familiar concept. We'll get a nicely specific uh, definition of usability so we can figure out how to actually benchmark that. Um, why we might actually want to do this in the first place because it can be a, a big undertaking. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we'll go over how we actually implemented this on the user experience design team. 
So first of all, what is a benchmark? You can just look this up on Wikipedia. It's any metric or measurement that is consistent that you can apply over and over again. So this could be a CPU performance in an application, um, manufacturing accuracy, or um, how much it takes to, or how much it costs to make any kind of um, unit that you're making. And then benchmarking is just how we get that measurement. So this could be imposing a workload on a system to see how that CPU fares, uh, the number of defects that come out of a manufacturing process, or a unit cost analysis. So what is usability? Um, we need to, this is obviously a little less tangible, so we need to um, zoom in on this to understand how we can actually go about measuring it. So broadly speaking, usability is just anybody's quality of experience when interacting with a product or a system. Um, in order to measure this, though, we look for um, a little more um, defined way of talking about it. So we go to the International Organization for Standardization's definition, um, the ISO 9241-11. So this gets referenced a lot in the user experience world if people want to be real technical with how they're talking about usability. But it essentially just has three main pillars that hold it up. The first is effectiveness, and this is how a user is able to complete their goal in the software or the system. And efficiency, um, which is how fast they can complete that goal. And then finally, and a little more subjectively, is satisfaction. Do they feel good about that process that they just hopefully completed in a good amount of time? So that's how we're defining usability for this benchmarking process. So now that we know what benchmarking is, we know what usability is, how can we actually benchmark it? So we'll go over again why we would want to do this in the first place, um, a few variations and features that you can make if you choose to go do a process similar to this, and how we put it all into action. So. Simply put, we just want to be sure that we're improving. With design work, it's not always as obvious as with uh, a computing system or even uh, a physical product to be sure that we're moving in the right direction. So this benchmarking process lets us be sure that the, the design changes that we're making are um, changing the ne moving the needle in the right direction. So we can get some sort of quantitative and empirical evidence that um, we're doing what we want to be doing. We can see what is changing and how much it is changing. So this is pretty much as simple as um, measuring wherever you're at, making some kind of change to uh, the product or system, and then measuring that again, comparing those measurements. And um, this is the core of benchmarking usability. There are some other side pieces to it as well, um, like you can get qualitative information that isn't a numerical metric, but can dig into the why something changed. So maybe users complete, you know, they add a project to OpenShift twice as fast, but qualitative information lets us know why that's actually changing, what's driving those quantitative metrics. And while what we did was measure a version um, compared to uh, an earlier version, you can also compare to a competitor product. If they you know, have a very similar space and a set of user goals, you can um, compare them to each other. Or you can also just compare to sort of an industry standard if you only have one version available for testing. So there are a few types of usability benchmarking. There's behavioral and there's retrospective, and these are two big buckets that we can categorize them into. So behavioral, we're actually watching participants attempt the goal in the software while they're being recorded and we observe um, their behaviors or um, anything that happens while they're working with the software. So again, this is focused on behavior, and we're measuring the user actions as they move through um, the, the actual software. And this is different from retrospective, where we have participants recall their recent experience with the product. Um, this is more focused on their memory of the product, their attitude, their feeling towards that software. So this is often done just through questionnaires, um, or just verbally asking the person. So these can also be combined. You don't just have to choose one or the other. And I would argue that they uh, should be combined because people's feelings and their behaviors are often kind of split apart. I've seen people um, just miserably fail a task that was very hard to do and they shouldn't have been able to complete it. They rate it five out of five on usability. You know, whether they want to please the researcher that's kind of helping them out with this or they just you know don't want to look like they haven't failed. Um, it's important if you're going to capture that retrospective information to see what they're actually doing because they're not often the same thing. And levels of usability benchmarking is how Zoom